industry on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Great stands of Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, cedar, spruce, or west coast hemlock. Just part of the timberland cultivated and harvested by the men of the Long Bell Lumber Company, who help bring us our never-ending supply of wood products. This tree will serve as a spar to which rigging will be attached for dragging out the timber brought down by falling crews, like this. An amazing array of machines and equipment are used these days in protecting the trees while they grow, cutting those that can grow no more, moving them from the forest to the mill, and processing them into the wide variety of products by means of which we put wood to work. The first step in developing useful products is accomplished at the head rake, where the log is opened up by a powerful band saw. The Sawyers had years of experience in getting the greatest possible value from each log. With every cut he makes, he decides which part of the log will be most suitable for a specific use. Flooring, structural timber, doors and windows, and so on. As the saw takes off a wide, clean cant, the Sawyer carefully examines the exposed face of the log. He must determine in the few seconds while the carriage is returning whether another can should be taken from this side or the log flipped over. He decides in favor of another can here and signals the block center how thick to make it. are rooted to the machines that will prepare them for uses the Sawyer has decided they will serve best. Top quality wood goes to gang saws that turn out vertical grain sizes. Each piece is cut to one of the standard lengths in a manner yielding the best possible grain. follow a few of the steps in the manufacture of just one of the finished products turned out by Long Bell. This high-grade vertical grain stock is being prepared for use indoors. Watch how the holes for the dowels are drilled, and the dowels are glued and inserted automatically. At the assembly points, the door parts come together from mills all over the country to be joined into an attractive, sturdy fitting use for a house. The coordination of the firm's operations and the speed and skill of its workers produce up to 3,000 doors a day at this one plant. Watching craftsmen working on good materials with good tools can be a pleasure. Something like the pleasure a craftsman himself derives from his labor. The press forces the glued parts together in a strong, perfectly symmetrical union. In the same way, thousands of parts converge at the window assembly benches. The precise machining of the joints allows the pieces to fit together smooth and tight. Dozens of different styles of windows are made up here, but the forethought and planning we have seen in previous operations brings the right part to the right bench at the right time. A good example of our mass production system at work. Each man, like this glazer, doing what he does best and doing it far better and faster than could anyone setting out to make the whole window by himself 
as our ancestors did. And our ancestors, though they worked twice as long and hard as we do, never lived in homes anything like these. Today's management recognizes that human progress must go hand in hand with mechanical and scientific advances. Thus, hundreds of manufacturing companies provide positions for handicapped persons so that they, like all of us, may gain the human dignity and personal satisfaction of being productive and earning a good income. Properly fitted to his job, the handicapped worker usually proves that he is equal and sometimes superior to other workers. Especially in these days of intense civilian and defense production, industry welcomes physically handicapped workers. Ever notice a photographer holding up a little instrument before snapping and wonder what it was? It's a light meter to take the guesswork out of camera settings. Here at the West Down Electrical Instrument Corporation in Newark, New Jersey, a lot of skilled craftsmen of both sexes are employed in putting together those delicate instruments whose pointers are moved by the power of light alone. The moving element of the meter, mounted on a jewel for the least possible friction, is tested for electrical resistance before the meter is assembled. Then it's mounted on a magnet that will fit into a coil. When electricity passes through the coil, it causes the magnet to indicate with the pointer the amount of electricity passing through the coil. Another test shows it's all okay up to this point. Meanwhile, they assemble the photoelectric cell that will pick up the light rays and transform them into electric current. Extremely low current to be sure, but strong enough to make that needle move. After all the gaskets, baffles, spacer rings, and other parts of the cell are installed, there's still another test to determine the cell's ability to register accurately the candle power to which it is exposed. After all their individual tests, the parts are put together into the finished product. This kind of assembly is a job for expert hands and none more expert than those of 74-year-old Ida Margraff, 46 years with the company. Back in 1917, a young trainee asked Ida if she thought he had a chance for advancement. Ida answered, you certainly do. And that trainee today is Earl R. Mellon, president of Weston, and still a staunch admirer of the lady who gave him such good advice 35 years ago. Let's talk it over, says the sign over this meeting room in Dayton, Ohio. And hundreds of representatives of educational, national, religious, and labor groups, service clubs, and women's clubs, as well as the general public, respond. It's an open house at which industrialists and businessmen get together with other leaders of the community to discuss the problems we all face today. The presidents of a number of the city's women's clubs discuss the question of how our business system operates. The need for unity among owners, employees, and consumers in meeting such current problems as inflation is further taken up in timely motion pictures in continuous showings. Then there's a snack at which informal discussions are resumed over coffee. Dramatizing the common interests of all Americans in the job of making sure that our system is allowed to go on functioning as successfully as in the past are displays like this. Americans all, with no problems we can't solve by getting together and talking them out as we've always done since the first town meeting over the cracker barrel of an 18th century general store. Inflation is a very real danger, America's number one menace on the home front. Inflation can wreck our economy, cripple our ability to build up the armed strength we need to resist aggression, undermine the soundness of our currency and credit, the strength of our free institutions, 
our unity and free government. To halt inflation and strengthen our dollar, all of us can lend a hand by producing better and improving our productivity, by helping to hold down costs, by using credit carefully, by opposing all extravagance and unnecessary spending in government, and by saving in every way. You may not recognize it, but this is New York City's Park Avenue, uptown in Harlem where the trains run above ground. And nestled here beside the tracks is a company that manufactures a very unusual product indeed. This is a sample. His name, King Kong. They're reviving the movie of the same name, and the firm of Messmore and Damon have built this animated monster to help draw in the crowds. Just one of the unusual assignments that are routine business to an organization that for 40 years has been supplying the needs of the people who entertain America. With its long experience in building props, sets, and animated figures for Chautauqua shows, carnivals, amusement parks, and Broadway plays, it was only natural for Messmore and Damon to take television right in stride. The company's designers carefully draw up blueprints for every imaginable type of set or display. This, for example, will become a miniature stage to be used by General Motors in exhibiting models of its new cars. The stage must be as realistic and built to exactly the same scale as the tiny autos it will frame. Many skilled craftsmen in a number of trades are employed here to help the artists of the advertising and entertainment worlds create precisely the illusion they have in mind. You can see how all the parts fit perfectly together, like the parts of the automobile they will help display to the public. When you ask the people here what their specialty is, they don't have an answer. This could be the first miniature stage they've built, or the hundred. They serve about the same function for certain branches of industry that the village handyman does. They'll tackle just about anything, even Egyptian dancing girls. The music produced is like nothing you've ever heard in Carnegie Hall. But when did a donkey ever lead the Philharmonic? or a leopard play first fiddle. Or a giraffe act as concert master. One thing is certain, there's never a dull moment in this business, and while one sour note can be taken in stride, too many of them in a row calls not for a Toscanini, but a man with a pair of pliers and a good long piece of wire. <laughs> <laughs> 